Welcome to Catholic Answers Live, the program where you participate with your questions about apologetics and evangelization, including the most important theological, spiritual, moral, and social issues facing the world today. Call now with your question for today's guest. Toll free, 1-888-31-TRUTH. That's 888-318-7884. Now, from San Diego, Catholic Answers Live. And welcome to Hour 2 here of Catholic Answers Live. Today's show, Why Are You Pro-Choice? And we had a great hour with Trent Horn last hour. This hour promises to be just as exciting. And we're asking all of you, if you hold the view that uh, pro-choice is the way to go, or maybe you're just really confused about it, um, and you need some direction there, please call in. It's your hour. Here's the number, 888 318-7884, 318-7884, truth But all of you listeners out there, if you are pro-life, then maybe call another time. Sit on your hands today, and let's let our pro-choice listeners call up and talk with Stephanie Gray. She's co-founder and executive director of the Canadian Center for Bioethical Reform. You may have seen her on ABC, NBC, Fox, and CBS-affiliated television news programs here in the States. Stephanie is also faculty at the Black Blackstone Legal Fellowship. She's author of A Physician's Guide to Discussing Abortion. And she holds a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from UBC in Vancouver and a certification with distinction in healthcare ethics from the National Catholic Bioethics Center in Philadelphia. And she is the one who will have those answers for you today. Stephanie, welcome to Catholic Answers Live. Thanks so much, Sherry. It's great to be on the program with you. It's great to be here with you as well. And again, to our listeners who are pro-choice, the number 888-31-TRUTH. And Stephanie, I know you've got a a debate coming up on Friday. Tell us a little bit about uh, that debate. Who's it with and what's it going to be about? Yeah, so this evening, or not this evening, this Friday evening, I'll be debating one of Canada's few late-term abortionists, Dr. Fraser Fellows. And uh, he has debated me on two previous occasions, uh, the first time at a medical school in Ontario, uh, and then at a, another university setting, and then this Friday will be at the University of Toronto. And uh, the resolve this week is, does abortion harm women? And uh Assumedly, he'll be making the case that it doesn't, and I'll, of course, be making the case that it does. Wow. Is there any place where we can see that uh, that debate? You know what? I am waiting on hearing whether this will be aired live, but certainly it will be put on the Internet following the debate, if not uh, uh, live. And uh, people can, if they go on to Google even now, if you were to search my name, Fraser Fellows, and Vimeo, our debate from January of this year, 88 minutes long, is is online there. Okay, terrific. Well, we appreciate that. Well, it sounds like we have a lot of calls coming in here. So I think without further ado, let's head to the phones. Again, the number is 888 888- 3187884 and today's program why are you pro choice first up we have Andrea and Andrea is listening in Sioux Falls South Dakota to the Lamb Catholic Radio Network there hey Andrea welcome to Catholic Answers Live hi <laughs> hi there um, welcome it's good to be on um i had a question um if if um we're giving all these rights these unborn babies, um, I mean, if we're treating them as humans, just like we treat everyone else, giving them all these rights and everything, then should should they be held accountable as human beings? Because, I mean, if the mother doesn't, or, yeah, if the mother doesn't want that baby to be in her womb, isn't that baby violating her rights? Well, that's a good question, Andrea. Uh, and yes, we are arguing that the preborn child should be considered a full person under the law, just as you or I are. Um, now, a question that comes to my mind is, if a woman gave birth in a hospital, and after the baby was taken away to be cleaned up, a nurse brought the baby back into the room, if the mother didn't want the baby in the room, would we blame the newborn child who is a full person under the law? Would we blame the newborn child for somehow violating that mother's rights? If she didn't what do want you it say? in the room? Right. Well, would I, we blame the newborn for that? No, because, I mean, in order, I think in order for you to, uh, oh, 
Oh, geez, I think I just punched a hole in my question. <laughs> um, in order for you to, uh, I mean, for it to be violated, you would have to say no and for it to continue going, right? See, um, see that again. I mean, in order in order for um, a, someone's right, you have to know that that person doesn't want it, and then if it continues, the, the right would be violated. Well, if right, that but not by the child, the room, right? No, not by would the child. With the infant, right? So the infant wouldn't be depriving the mother of her rights because the infant isn't even conscious of what where the infant is, right? That's true. Yes. So in the same way, the preborn child, who absolutely is a full moral person, due to her age, like an infant, isn't conscious of where she is and so forth. And just as an infant didn't choose to be placed in a hospital room post-birth, a preborn child didn't choose to be placed in the mother's body. So if we're not going to say the born child is somehow violating the mother, why would we say the preborn child is violating the mother? Wouldn't that work both ways, though? I mean, if the baby didn't get a choice in the matter of coming into the room, why would we still think it has a choice in staying in the womb? Well, would it be okay for someone to kill the baby in the hospital room because the mother doesn't want the baby there? That's a completely different thing. If the mother doesn't want the baby there, it has the option to be adopted. I mean, a baby can't... I mean. Preborn, the baby can't survive outside the mother and therefore is essentially a part of the mother, which, you know, sometimes they have to be, uh, certain things have to be removed from people and you're not going to hold, like, um, say, say one of your kidneys went bad. You're not going to hold that kidney accountable for going bad. Okay, and a kidney, is that a person or a part of a person? Well, before birth, it is a part of her. No, 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 but just wait, a kidney. Is a kidney a part of a person or a whole person? It is a part of a person. Okay, and that kidney will never grow into an adult? No. Okay, now the preborn child, will that preborn child grow into an adult? It could. It does have the potential to grow into an adult, but at the time it is not. It is an adult, yes. Not, so it's, yeah, it's not it's, an adult, it's not a person. Well, see, there's a difference the between world. adults and persons. Would you say children aren't adults, but they're still people? Yes, they are. Okay, so therefore the preborn child isn't an adult, but is nonetheless still a person. After all, are the parents of the preborn child people? The man and the woman, are they people? They are. So wouldn't it follow that two people produce another person they do so therefore since what they produce is the same thing that they are we're just talking about a younger version of them a person who's younger than adults who are also people and I think you know one of the points that you make which I think has some validity to it is the born child can be placed for adoption whereas the pre-born child cannot at least mm-hmm. during the pregnancy. Uh, one right. thought that comes to my mind, though, is does that make us less responsible or more responsible for the preborn child? Because what you're rightly pointing out is that, you know, five people could take care of the infant, but only mm-hmm. one person can take care of the preborn child. Well, you know, let's right. say you're in a restaurant and there's someone at the table next to you that starts choking. And let's say there's, you know, 20 other people in the restaurant, and in fact there's a paramedic who's going to do a better job than you at the Heimlich maneuver, so they jump up and they help the person. Now, because you didn't jump up, are you going to be held responsible? No. Okay, you but let's imagine instead of... What's that? I said, no, you, you wouldn't be held responsible. Right, and there, and, and there are other people to help. But let's imagine instead of 20 people in the restaurant, it's just you and the person choking. And let's say you know the Heimlich maneuver. Let's say you teach it. Now you're the only person who can save them. Would we say that you're more responsible by virtue of being the only one around to help? Yes, you would be more responsible. And Okay. On, I, just, I just want to say on that note, I'm not saying that abortion 
is the best choice. I'm just saying sometimes it is the only choice, and it's not and it's it's not for everyone. I mean, sure, keep abortion, but put heavy laws on it, like things like tests you have to pass or um, regulate it or something. Now, if I could ask, Andrea, why would you want to regulate abortion? Why would you want to limit it in some way? Because there's there's people who are careless, and there's people who just can't. I mean, careless people who didn't take the necessary actions to protect themselves and have this baby on the way and can board it and can do all that, yes, take care of that child. Do so you do believe it's a child? Once it's born, yes. Well, if it's only a child when it's born, why would you limit someone's choice to have an abortion when you believe they've been, quote-unquote, frivolous or whatever, careless? Um, If there's nothing wrong with abortion, why would you limit them from having one? Because it's, it's, oh, how do I want to put it? Um, it's, I guess it comes, I think, I believe it all comes down to how responsible a person is. I mean, you could have, you know, give birth to that child and then put him up for adoption, but there, there are orphanages everywhere where children don't get adopted every day. Yes, and, and, and you're right about that, and that's, that's a tragedy that we as a society need to respond to. I think as people of faith, even scripturally, we see that we are, are commanded to care for orphans. Um, now, my question for you, though, is would it be wrong to kill the children who are born, even though there's no one to care for them or adopt them? Would you ones, say that would ones, be wrong? Ones that have like already been already been born and you know set up for adoption and everything. Yeah, I guess my point is: Do you recognize that the value of an individual isn't grounded in who will care for them and whether someone is available to adopt them, but it's grounded in their membership in the human family? Would you agree no, with I mean, that? Once born, I do believe every individual is important. But well, let me ask you this, Andrea. Do you believe in human rights? I do. Well, then what about the pre-born humans' rights? I don't believe you have any rights until you're born. Until you're Well, let me ask you this. Who gets to... human rights that you believe humans have? Who gets human rights? Anyone that has that has been born that Yeah, anyone who has been born wouldn't Every that be person? born rights? I'm sorry? If you only get rights when you're born, then it sounds to me like such a right would be applied, be called birth rights. Right. But human rights are granted to humans, regardless of your state in life, your environment, or whether you're born or not. So it sounds right. to me like you don't believe in human rights, you just believe in birth rights. And that may be so. So you don't believe in human rights then? If if you're if it's going to be worded that right if it is going to be worded that way, then no, I guess I don't believe in human rights. I believe that once you're born and you <sighs> So you'd be okay with me having an abortion at eight months? No, not at eight months. Well, if the baby's not born. Who are you to tell me I can't have an abortion at eight months? I'm not saying you can't have an abortion. I don't believe it's right, but I'm not saying you can't have an abortion. Okay, so you would be, I could have an abortion at eight months in your world. If you could create a law, you wouldn't have a law stopping me from obtaining an abortion at eight months. Is that correct? If, If I was to create a law, it would have those regulations I was talking about earlier. And one of the things that I would include in it is at what age or what 
for how late you can do an abortion because I believe that once that baby is able to survive outside the womb, it has rights. Okay, well, that's yes, different Stephanie. from what you said a moment. Yeah, go ahead. I do apologize. We've got to go to break here for our stations. But, Andrea, if you would like to continue talking about this, we can hold you on over the break. So you talk to the call screener while uh, uh, while we take our break here. But as you're listening right now, this is Why Be Pro-Choice, and we're asking our pro-choice listeners to call in one 888-318-7884. We've got more on the other side of this break here with Stephanie Gray and, and Catholic Answers Live. Stay with us. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. Stephanie Gray is with us this hour, and it's Why Be Pro, Pro-Choice. And you Pro-Choice listeners, this is your hour to call in and get your questions answered. And again, we do ask our pro-life listeners to not call in today. We love it when you call in, just not today. So maybe choose another day. In fact, tomorrow, Jimmy Aiken and Jim Blackburn will be on on an open forum Q&A Tuesday, and Patrick Coffin will be back. And so that might be a good time for your question. In the meantime, pro-choice listeners, here is your number to call. It is 888-31-TRUTH. 888-318-7884. And I do want to thank Andrea for uh, spending so much time with us, and we do hope that you'll keep listening, Andrea. And we hope that you'll call again when Stephanie is on. But, Stephanie, let's move on here now. Nate has been waiting very patiently, listening to our friends at Station of the Cross in Rochester, New York. And, Nate, welcome to Catholic Answers Live. Hi. Hi there. So, um, What's your question, Nate? Well, I am a male rape victim, and that's a big part of the reason why I'm pro-choice. Um, if I was of the other gender and put in the situation, I would have aborted the result of that. Um, I'm hearing a lot throughout this discussion about the rights of the unborn child, but um, mainly in rape situations, potentially in some medical situations, it seems like that's kind of ignorant or overlooks the rights of the mother. Mm. Well, you know, um, Nate, first of all, thank you for being willing to to share what you just have shared with us. Um, you know, I'm, I can't even begin to fathom the suffering that you've gone through, and um, I think tragically what you've experienced is not uh, foreign to many people. I think sexual assault is is far more common than many people realize. And I, even as you just share that, I, two men are coming to mind that I have met in recent years who have also shared with me that they uh, are male rape victims. So um, I'm deeply sorry for that suffering that you've gone through. And I think what, what you, in asking that question, can really identify with for the female rape victims is such an experience of a brutal violation uh, that you know to your core was so against um, humanity uh, causes you to want to help that rape victim, that female rape victim. And it's understandable that you wouldn't want that suffering to continue for her. And if she gets pregnant, she's going to be continually reminded of that rape. Let me ask you, though, to consider, uh, Nate, if um, a rape victim gets pregnant and has an abortion, Will she no longer have memories of the rape? She'll have the memories, but she won't have a reminder that she'll have to care for. So you're right. She'll still have the memories. You're right. She won't have the reminder to care for. Now, is it possible, though, that she wouldn't have to care for the child if she placed the child for adoption? It's possible, but then she has the memories of the nine months that she had to put up with the pregnancy that she didn't want. I understand that giving birth can be a joyous and lovely thing, but that's typically when you want it, when it's a result of a crime and violation against, as you said, your base humanity. I can't imagine that being a pleasant nine months. You're right. And you know what, Nate, if the question is, will it be easy or difficult for a rape victim to carry through with a pregnancy from rape? If the question is easy versus difficult, you win. Um, It will be difficult. And if that's how we determine the rightness or wrongness of choices, easy versus hard, then you win. Now, my question is, though, do we make decisions in life based on what's easy versus hard or what's based on right versus wrong? Well, 
we're not talking about decisions. We're talking about legislating what decisions other people have available to them. And it comes down to what the decision is. So, for example, let's take the rapist himself. I mean, I think that rapist should be thrown in jail, and I think he should be forced to do hard labor. I mean, there should be some serious days of suffering ahead for the person who has inflicted such a brutal crime on such an innocent person. Do you think it's fair, though, to give the death penalty to the innocent child? No, but I don't think it's fair for... The burden isn't a temporary one. Raising, it, having a child is a fiscal burden as well that you're then asking for this woman to assume. Like, I don't imagine that there's any one that um, provides relief for uh, rape victims' children or something like that. It just... And if there's, if there's, there's not... Okay, go ahead. There's a lot that goes into the decision that, yes, there's, there's moral aspects to it, but there's a case that I'm thinking of a little while ago. Somebody abducted a bunch of women and held them for like 12 years or something and had them have kids and whatnot. If oh, they right, Ariel Castro, if, yes. Yeah, yes. If, if one of those women was pregnant when they were finally found and they wanted to have that kid aborted because they didn't want to go through that all over again, like that, that's a phenomenally complex situation, even morally, I would think. And to create a law that just says you don't have this option seems uncompassionate. Well, and I think, you know, you raise a good point about that horrible story that came out of Ohio. And one of those rape victims who was just brutalized for years did get pregnant. Um, One had several miscarriages, but one of the other girls was able to carry on with the pregnancy. And then she came out and her little girl, I believe, is about five or eight years old now. Would it be okay to kill that eight-year-old because she's a reminder of that monster's crime. You have to deal with the situation you're giving. That eight-year-old is was born under captivity. That woman should be able to have that eight-year-old adopted. But no, that eight-year-old has a right to life because she's no longer physically dependent upon the mother. You find out you're raped, one of the first things you do is get a pregnancy test. Yeah. You know, I'm well, hearing Stephanie, the music uh, there. I think we have yeah. to take a break, Nate. I'm but really Nate, if grateful you would like that to you stay over. In. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you'd like to stay over, we can continue talking, Nate, uh, and we'll let, let you talk with our call screener about that. But, friends, there is more to come here with Stephanie Gray, and we have more questions from our pro-choice listeners on the way. So stay with us here at Catholic Answers Live. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. Our show this afternoon is Why Are You Pro-Choice? Stephanie Gray is our guest, and she's co-founder and executive director of the Canadian Center for Bioethical Reform. And before our break, that just, you know, we had to take, you just don't have any choice here. We were talking with Nate in Rochester. And, Nate, thank you so much for your patience, and we appreciate the fact that you were willing to stay on. Um, And I'll just kind of hand it over to you and Stephanie, and the two of you can continue with this great conversation. Great, Nate. You know, just as I I was thinking about um, kind of what we already discussed, it sounds like we both agree that the act of abortion will not undo the injustice of rape, nor will it take the memories of the trauma away. And it also sounds like we agree that it's not fair that the child get the death penalty. So, The question then is, will it be difficult to carry through with the pregnancy? Absolutely. There aren't words to describe how difficult. Do we need to support the woman and the child conceived in rape? Wholeheartedly, yes. My question is, though, again, may we kill an innocent child because of the father's crime? What do you think? I think that to directly answer your question no however i think that your definition of child is variable um i think that i don't consider something that physically requires another being 
to exist um, a, a child. I consider that a fetus, embryo. It's a different classification of being to me. Okay, and so maybe then that is the crux of the issue, because it sounds like even with the example that we both can agree on, even coming out of Ohio with the, uh, that Ariel who, who you know, kept these three women captive and tortured them, um, we both can agree that the eight-year-old, if that's the age of the child, but this eight-year-old conceived through rape um, may not be killed because she's a human. And so it sounds to me then that you're calling into question what the preborn are because they're in their mom's bodies. So I guess what I'm wondering is, um, when did that eight-year-old's life begin? I realize that this is kind of a flexible point to say because it depends very much on scientific advancement, but the age of viability. Okay, so if, let's take the age of viability. Now, there's some debate. People are saying between, you know, 20 to 24 weeks, babies, you know, can, can survive out of the womb. But if we, let's say, let's just pick 24 weeks, okay? Let's just say 24 weeks. That implies that we've been counting time for how many weeks if we say 24 weeks? How long have we been um, clocking time? How many weeks? What, six months? Yeah, six months, or I kind of gave it away, but also 24 weeks, right? So if we yeah. talk about 24 weeks, we're implying something happened 24 weeks ago that was pretty significant enough for us to consider we should press start on the clock and watch time go on. So wouldn't it make sense if someone's 24 weeks old that their life began 24 weeks ago at fertilization? No, there's still opportunity for miscarriage. Oh, and is there not opportunity for death after birth as well? Yeah, but again, I'm a, I'm not dependent on anything else. I'm not physically hooked up to anything else. If, if okay, you want to talk about euthanasia as well or, or care about that, I'll have the same arguments if I'm on the you know euthanasia side of it. Right. I thought our question was not whether someone is dependent, but whether someone is human. Is is our right I to life grounded I'm, I'm in our I'm dependency or grounded in our humanity? I suppose I'm basing my definition of humanity on dependence. Okay, so then how would you respond to someone who said, because an infant cannot live on her own, she's fully dependent on someone to care for her, Me, we may kill the infant. What would you say in response to someone who says that? I'm not defining dependence that strictly. And they would say, I am. Tell me why I'm wrong. Well, that's an argument that we can have, but I don't know the person who wants to kill babies. Or do you? See, the only difference between the line you've drawn and the imaginary person I just created was one of age. So well, then, why should our right to life be based on how old we are, Nate? Well, what side of the birth control debate are you on? Because if you want to have this sort of discussion, we can go right back to the ejaculation. Well, I think there's there's a, a difference there. I mean, certainly the the Catholic Church teaches that there are um, the usage of contraception is immoral, but not because it kills in the case of condoms, for example, but because it separates this, the unitive from the procreative, the very nature of the sexual act. That's a different argument, though, from what I'm proposing right now, which is that once life has begun. Is it wrong to end that life? So this isn't a question about what is the nature of the sexual act. It's a question of when the sexual act brings about life, do we believe all humans are equal? So do you believe all humans are equal? Depending on how you define human. Well, uh, if someone has two human parents, will it follow that they themselves are human? At a point. 
Okay, so two humans, would you agree, can only produce another human? Yes, I'll agree to that. Okay, so then we have three options for when that human can begin its life. Before fertilization, at fertilization, or after fertilization. Would you agree that we have one of those three options at our disposal? Yep. Correct. Okay, so let's take before. Let's take the sperm. Will the sperm in the man's body ever become an adult, ever become a baby, and then an adult? No. Independently, no. Right, correct. And the eggs in my body, if there's no sperm in my body, will my eggs ever grow into a baby and then an adult? Independently, no. Okay, correct. So therefore, option one is out of the question. You and I can both agree that life cannot begin before fertilization. So let's so consider for a moment. So we're and after. We're, sorry, what was that? I said, so we're left conception and after. Correct, exactly. So we've got two options. So let's consider uh, the at conception. The genetic information which makes Nate Nate and Stephanie Stephanie, is that determined at fertilization? Yeah. Okay. And the one-celled embryo, will it grow into then two cells, four cells, eight, 16, and so forth? Barring complication, yes. Okay, agreed. There could always be complications. So then will the one-celled embryo in the right environment grow into a baby and then an adult? Yes. After fertilization then, don't we just have an older version of the same individual whose life began? At conception? That's like making an argument that a colony of bacteria is should be treated as sentient because it could eventually evolve to that point. Okay, that's a good point. And I think what comes to mind is why can't uh, a cell of bacteria, let's say, think Versus why can't a one-celled human embryo think? Why can't a bacteria think? Uh, lack of requisite organs. Okay, and, and it's not within its nature to have those requisite organs. But would you say it is within human nature to be thinking creatures? Yes, but I'd also say it's within okay. all things nature to improve themselves. And, and we, could, we could have that discussion, but in terms of the entity before us or an individual before us in that moment for that, that generation, it's not within the nature of a bacteria to think. It is within the nature of a human to think. The bacteria cannot think because of what it is. The one-celled human embryo cannot think because of how old it is. See, by virtue of having human parents, which you agreed the embryo has, it therefore follows that that offspring of the humans has the same nature and simply can't think because of how old it is. So if you say we may kill the one-celled human embryo, it would follow that you'd be guilty of age discrimination. Okay. So and Nate and Stephanie... So I think we, we do need to leave it there and go to break. But, uh, Nate, we really appreciate your call. This has been a fascinating you, conversation. And uh, we hope that you'll keep listening and perhaps call again. Stephanie will be on, I think, later on this month, in fact. And, Nate, please know that we will keep you in our prayers as well. Thank you, Nate. We appreciate that. All right, we've got more with Stephanie Gray, and she's the co-founder, executive director of the Canadian Centre for Bioethical Reform, and also she's the author of A Physician's Guide to Discussing Abortion. And uh, it looks like Teo Filo and Francis and James, you are up next on Catholic Answers Live. Here is the number to call if you'd like to join the conversation, 888-318-7884. More coming up on Catholic Answers Live. 
Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. I'm Sherry Brown Rigg, and Patrick Coffin will be back tomorrow, and he'll bring you an open forum Q&A Tuesday, and Jimmy Aiken and Jim Blackburn will be the apologist at hand. And we have one more segment here of Why Are You Pro-Choice? and got some great calls lined up. Here's that number if you'd like to join them, 888-3187-884. And Stephanie Gray is here to answer these wonderful pro-choice questions. Stephanie, let's head right back to the phones here, and I'm going to give this name a shot here. It looks like Teofilo, who is listening in Albuquerque in 98.9 FM, our friends there at Immaculate Heart Radio. How did I do? You did well. Very good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> My Spanish is not so good, but I give it a shot. What's your question for Stephanie? Yes, well, I have a, what, I have a reason why I'm pro-choice. Well, 33 years ago, my daughter was in high school and she got pregnant. But well, we got together and we decided which way it was going to go with her. And I told her that she could, uh, I would uh, go with her if she had the baby and also, uh, also if she would have an abortion. And I was pushing toward abor- abortion. She chose life. And 33 years later now, we have a beautiful grandson. And I don't, I, I don't know what I would have done if, if I had, cho- if I had, if she had chosen abortion. So that's that's why I'm a pro-life. And mm-hmm. but I have a question. Let's say that this uh, lady was having a baby and could not get to the hospital. She called the police. The police and the paramedics. They all both went there. And at that time, as they arrived, the baby was almost getting ready to be born. And but she wasn't sure if she wanted the baby or not. Well, the baby started coming and ha- it was halfway out. And now, what would happen if she, if she had chose to kill the baby at that time? Well, that's a great question, Teofilo. And uh, first of all, let me say that I'm so grateful that your daughter chose to uh, protect the life of of your grandson. Um, And I think what you raise with your question shows the absurdity of where our culture is at, that we are living in a world where where we are seems to determine what we are, which is ludicrous. And yet, if the child is is not fully out of the mother's body, if it's in her body, then it's not considered a human person under the law. And in fact, people would say that uh, if she could come up with a reason arguing that she needed abortion, even for her health, but the word health is defined so broadly as to include her economic health or emotional health and so on and so forth, that if the baby's in her body, she has a right to kill it. But if it's out of her body, then she's going to be on trial for murder. And the only difference is one of environment. So tragically, we're living in a messed up world. So what happens if it's halfway out? If she kills it then, is she going to get, is she going to get uh, uh, murdered? Uh, well, I guess, murder? I guess, you, I guess you raise a good point insofar as um, if the child's halfway, which, which, which applies the, because you've got half in and half out. I can speak for uh, where, of course, I am based in Canada. You're not considered a person until you have fully proceeded in a living state from the body of your mother. So because the child wasn't fully proceeded from the body of the mother, that would be considered an abortion, not a homicide. All right. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful question, Teofilo. We do appreciate that. And got another call. This one is from Frances, and she's in Ann Arbor, listening to 990 AM, our friends there at Ave Maria. And Frances, welcome to Catholic Answers Live. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm seriously pro-life, but I do believe in person's right of choice. And I think the Supreme Court overlooked the freedom, the responsibility of freedom, and they they just, um, my point is, is we totally uh, cut the father out of the situation if there's an abortion. But if the woman chooses to have the child, then they say, oh, you can pay. So I always believed that the Supreme Court failed making the man who created this situation for the woman pay. And I believe that if a woman, you know, I'm against abortion at any time, but if we're going to give them the right to kill their child, we should enforce through DNA testing to have the father pay. And, um, you know, it's a serious problem for this country, and you know everybody's trying to put it off on a woman, but it's the man's problem. 
And all those well, guys Francis, have... Francis, let's go ahead and let Stephanie reply to that. We appreciate your call, Francis. Yeah, well, and, you know, certainly, Francis, you know, you speak about freedom, and I think it's important that we define, you know, for our culture what freedom really is. And freedom is not merely the ability to choose, but the ability to choose and do that which is right. And so as it sounds like you acknowledge, uh, the right thing to do is carry that pregnancy to term. The wrong thing would be for the mother or the father, for anyone uh, to end the life of their offspring, and it's just not the way to go if we believe in human rights, because if we believe in human rights, humans get human rights, and the most basic right is the right uh, to be to life, the right to uh, equal rights under the law, and to be protected from an unjust murder. Thank you so much, Francis. And I do want to remind our listeners that if you are pro-life, we ask that you call in another day. We're reserving our calls and our questions in the airtime for those who hold the pro-choice viewpoint. And that number to call, we've got a phone line that's opened up for you right now, is 888-318-7884, truth And our guest this hour is Stephanie Gray. She's co-founder and executive director of the Canadian Centre for Bioethical Reform. Form. And Stephanie, I know you've got that interesting debate coming up on Friday with the, mm. I think you mentioned the, on, the only late-term abortionist there in Canada, or perhaps one of the most notorious. And the topic is whether abortion is good for women or not. And that's mm-hmm. something that really is out there a lot right now. And uh, yes. I think that's a question that maybe we can talk about right now. Why is it not good for women? Why is abortion not good for women? Sure. Well, yeah, I'll just uh, clarify there. He's one of the few late-term abortionists in Canada. And yes, well, I'm the sad there's more about, than one. <laughs> yes, yes, I know. Um, but with regards to, you know, how abortion harms women, this is something that more and more research is showing that it harms women physically, uh, emotionally, of course, spiritually. And, you know, the simple way I put it to people is this. When a woman goes to a doctor and gets a pregnancy test, Will the, and it comes back positive. Will the doctor think there's something wrong with her body, or will he think, hmm, her body is functioning normally? And he's going to think the latter. Now, if she goes to the doctor and has a test done and discovers that she's had a miscarriage, is the doctor going to think there's something wrong with her body or her body's functioning normally? Well, clearly, he's going to look at the miscarriage as a sign something's gone wrong. So pregnancy is a sign that the body is working right, and pregnancy within the designs of our body is meant to go to birth with a live delivery of a child. So what is abortion? It thwarts that very natural, healthy process, and it interrupts the pregnancy such that you have to force the cervix open when it's naturally closed early in pregnancy. So the forcing of the cervix can cause trauma to the cervix, lacerations or cutting on the cervix, uh, and can result in cervical incompetence in future pregnancies. So one of the risks is that when a woman aborts her first pregnancy, let's say five years later when she wants to be pregnant again, uh, she gets pregnant and halfway through that pregnancy, her cervix opens too early and she miscarries the child. So the effects of one abortion can lead to multiple effects when it comes, sorry, can lead to effects on, on subsequent pregnancies. Another risk, physical risk of an abortion is a perforation of the uterus because essentially it's a blind procedure where the abortionist is moving the suction tube, you know, in and around um, uh, the, the uterus. And so when he's moving it in and out, there have been times where he's actually punctured the wall of the uterus and starts to suck small bowel, for example, out of, out of the mother's body. So that is a, a consequence. The risk of breast cancer, people will say, you know, that that's not a risk, but the reality is we know it's a risk and here's why. What increases a woman's risk of breast cancer is exposure to estrogen, high levels of estrogen. What decreases our risk is having babies, having lots of them, and breastfeeding them. And the reason for that is you have less menstrual cycles and therefore less exposure to estrogen. So the key factor with with breast cancer risk is estrogen exposure. Well, when a woman's pregnant, her estrogen levels skyrocket. 
it in a form of estrogen called estradiol. And that estrogen causes the cells in her breast to multiply at a very rapid level. But at this point, these multiplying cells are called undifferentiated cells, which means they don't have a specific role yet. If she has bad breast cells, those have just multiplied. So now she has more bad cells. Now, that's okay if she makes it to the 32nd week of pregnancy, because then at that point, those cells are going to become differentiated, which means they take on a very specific role of producing milk. But the vast majority of abortions occur long before the 32nd week. So when you unnaturally cut that pregnancy off, you leave those breast cells in a very vulnerable state where they're undifferentiated where you may have had a multiplication of bad cells and that can develop into cancer later in life. So those are just uh, a few examples of the physical harms, of course. I think if we look at why abortion is wrong, it's wrong because it kills children. And therefore, because it kills children, not only does it hurt women physically, because our bodies were meant to carry children to birth, but it hurts women emotionally and spiritually because to come to terms with the idea that one has aided uh, in the death of her child with the assistance of doctors and nurses uh, is going to be an emotionally and spiritually traumatic thing. Uh, the only good news in all of this, of course, though, is that uh, as people of faith, we are, are believers of a, a loving and a merciful God. You know, that wherever we have sinned, if we go to God with a repented heart, you know, he is, he is eager, he's willing to forgive. Of course, in the Catholic faith, we have the beautiful sacrament of reconciliation to experience God's mercy very tangibly uh, in that, that sacrament. So that is the hope, but there's also that very troubling news, the bad news, that abortion is, is not only killing children, but it's hurting women physically, emotionally, and spiritually. You know, Stephanie, I've often heard it said from those who are on the pro-choice side that they point to statistics that I've never been able to find, that more women die in childbirth than die in abortion. How can we refute that? Well, I think it's important to refute that by asking a question, and that is, what is the cause of death for those women who die in childbirth? And when we identify what the causes of death are, what we realize is the solution isn't abortion. It's having medical, better medical care. It's having birth attendance in countries where, you know, in some parts of Africa where women are left birthing alone, uh, the child gets stuck in the birth canal, uh, they labor for days. You know, the solution isn't abortion. It's getting good medical care. Amen. Well, Stephanie Gray, I do want to thank you so much for a wonderful hour. And our listeners there, we hope that uh, you've benefited from what Stephanie had to say. And Stephanie, a, a pleasure to work with you. Thanks so much for having me on. God bless you. Stephanie is the co-founder and executive director of the Canadian Center for Bioethical Reform, and she's also the author of A Physician's Guide to Discussing Abortion. Patrick Coffin will be back tomorrow, and remember, he has an open forum Q&A. Jimmy Aiken and Jim Blackburn will be there, so if you've got an opportunity to call in and ask questions, any question will do tomorrow, and that is coming up tomorrow with Patrick Coffin. Here's that number so you can have it handy tomorrow, 888-318-7884. 888 truth Thank you so much for joining us here on this wonderful edition of Catholic Answers Live. Be safe and God's blessings to you.